Okay, so the basic deal here is that last time we transitioned from a discussion of linear models to non, non linear dynamic models, models whose evolution depends on their state, to nonlinear dynamic models. And you'll recall that we've been taking four perspectives um, with respect to these various models. Um, two of those perspectives are structural in character, two of them are behavioral. The two structural ones involve um, depiction as stock and flows. Secondly, depiction as ODEs, sort of a compiled down to its minimal core set of elements, but in a way that strips away the elements of human understanding on where the feedbacks lie, intermediate quantities that are of human significance, but, um, but get compressed down to the ODEs. It turns a given flow into two terms in the ODEs, right? One out of the one it, whence it comes and one into the state variable or stock, whither it goes, okay? Um, and uh, the, but those are two ways of depicting the structure of the system, okay? Um, in addition to that, we took on a, a set of two behavioral perspectives, two wit, one that involves a lens that understands model behavior over time, um, and secondly, uh, a mechanism that depicts state space. And today we're going to be focusing predominantly on state space, okay? Um, and, uh, and specifically, we're going to be uh, using state space as a way to understand some of the unique features of a um, of these nonlinear systems, uh, a, in the sense that we can linearize that system, but we can only linearize around a given fixed point. Um, there's there's terms in the evolution of the system that prevent us from linearizing that are nonlinear, and they prevent us from linearizing around the entire system. As a result. We, um, while we can linearize around areas where the nonlinear terms uh, essentially disappear, um, the offset term, for example, has disappeared, it, that won't be a linearization that covers the entire space, okay? Um, and, uh, and so we, we have to circumscribe our analysis in state space, recognizing that linearization is around a certain a certain point, okay? Secondly, um, we're gonna examine cases uh, as time allows where we have multiple basins of attraction, okay? Now, um, I am going to uh, continue to flail here at the cost of, uh, uh, of, of having ugly um, uh, depictions on the screen. Um, uh, and what I'm hoping to do is to get the full, the full slides here at least, okay? So in general, when we have linear, um, excuse me, when we have nonlinear systems, um, we have uh, something along these lines, um, S dot or, or, or DSDT equals some function of, of state. This is what, again, characterizes as a dynamical system. The fact that it evolves, how it evolves, as, as dot, depends on its current state, S, right? It's the evolution of its state factor depends on the current state. We're making use of uh, differential equations here, but the truth is that variants of this apply for all dynamical systems models, regardless of whether they happen to be articulated in system dynamics and, 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 and ODE type form, whether they happen to be articulated in agent-based modeling or discrete event modeling. Now, for uh, linear systems, um, we, we found 
earlier, several lectures ago, that we could simplify this. So we could simply write um, in a blunt way, S dot equals JS, okay? Where J is the what? Jacobian matrix, right. Um, and uh, this, that's this matrix up here on um, the upper line, right? Um, and uh, this is in contrast to a nonlinear system um, where we, we have several terms uh, that would have to additionally be considered. So there'd be an offset term, right? Some, some offset here in general, basically, this this JS uh, for a nonlinear system would be just one term of of, of many. Um, it would be a particularly significant term, but there'd be an offset term earlier, and there'd be some higher order terms. I, I think you remember this from earlier lectures, um, but maybe maybe I'll see quickly if I could uh, just remind you on that here. Um, here we go. Uh, just so we we can see the the form of it uh, explicitly shown, right? Um, and let me go to the end here. Okay, um, uh, this is really exciting. Um, it's uh, exhibiting computational dysfunction of a most unusual character. Um, so uh, let me let me get this displayed again. Here we go. The mouse has disappeared and. The rat has appeared. Um, okay, um, right. So in general, we have something like this for a for a nonlinear term, higher order terms, and some offset term, which is itself a, f a function of of state. All right. Um, so if we are expanding, as it were, f in a Taylor series. Reflecting the fact that we're dealing with vectors here, but this is a Taylor series. This is kind of the offset term, f of s. Well, we're, we're considering the evolution of a system around a point s question mark. And this f term in general will be have some offsets associated with it. It's vector function. And it will say, you know, at, around that point, the system is evolving at a certain rate. And then as you displace from that point in different directions, this s minus s, question mark it, you know, you're going to get characteristic uh, changes to the system as mediated by the Jacobian matrix. And there's going to be some higher order terms, okay? Um, so this is the more general form that we're going to be dealing with. And when we're dealing with nonlinear systems, we can't take these simplifications in the bottom part of the slides. We've got to deal with this term is generally there, except around a what? I referred to it in my comments just a few minutes ago, except around a fixed point. Because at a fixed point, what very significant thing is true? If S question mark is a fixed point, what do we know? Well, by definition, a fixed point is a point where the derivative is what? Zero. The system is not changing, right? So this first term goes around, away around a fixed point. And the lowest order term that's represented is this one involved in the Jacobian, okay, and its displacement. Now, we still have higher order terms, but those involve things like S minus S question mark squared, right? And if we make the, if we're examining things very close to S question mark, to the fixed point, where F of S question mark is zero, then we can drop the higher order terms. There are they're going to be small. You're going to have like, if, if S minus S question mark is on the order of 0.01, you're going to have 0.01 squared. It's going to be, you know, 0 0.0001, right? Um, so it's going to be very small compared to these terms. And, and by, if, by getting close enough to S question mark, we'll be able to ignore those higher order terms. By definition, at the fixed point, this first term is, is zero. Do you understand that? Okay. So this is the, the general strategy that we're using, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and really this slide should at some level have been um, you know, in that other slide deck. So I will, I will without uh, 
um, without blushing, uh, copy it over there, okay? Um, uh, so, so there we go, and I will post it to the Moodle site um, uh, later today. Okay, so that's a reminder of where we're at, and it's a reminder of why it's so important this that we're considering things around a fixed point for nonlinear systems. Because otherwise, this f of s question mark is going to dominate often. It's wherever we are in state space, s sub point s question mark in general, we're going to have an f of s question mark which is going to be deriving the, which is going to be driving the rate of change of s, s dot. Um, we can't just look at the Jacobian because it, at that point, I mean, it's not that meaningful to look at the Jacobian for an arbitrary point S question mark to get insights into why the system is shaped in state space the way it is. Because, well, the Jacobian may, may affect displacements from that point. You've got such driving stuff in this first term that, uh, that that's really a lot of what shapes the, the contours, okay? So... We're going to be focusing around fixed points because this first term disappears. And we're going to look at the Jacobian um, and, and points around the Jacobian. Okay? Um, that's that's uh, sort of how we're going, um, going uh, th through this uh, process in order to, to understand these um, state space portraits such as that here. So... Um, we simplified last time a model that was an SIR model, taking advantage of the fact that what? That the a yeah, it's a constant population. The total population is invariant; it's fixed, and so we can express one of these states as just the total population a constant minus susceptible minus the in fact minus the other two. In other words. And that allows us to turn what is nominally a three-dimensional system into a two-dimensional system. We're taking advantage of the conservation of the population here, okay? There's, there's a conservation law which constrains how susceptible, infected, and recover evolves such that the sum is always equal to that. So it only has two degrees of freedom, as we say. This is gonna be very important reasoning, that sort of reasoning when we understand the effects of nonlinearity on state space dimension. Because here, the dimension goes down from three to two because there's a very stiff constraint involving these, these three stocks. They're not evolving independently. One is basically determined totally by the other two, you know, given some total population constant. And so what is nominally uh, three-dimensional system turns out to actually be a two-dimensional system because of this constraint. And what we're going to see is with nonlinear systems, coupling, other forms of coupling between these, the fact that they're not independent, that one is so tightly entangled with the other, means the actual dimensionality would be lower than the nominal dimensionality. It's, it's, it's kind of another side of that coin, if, if it, as it were. But for now, we just simplified this from three to two dimensions. And um, we had a system which involved a 3D state space, three state variables shown here and integrated up. This was the Jacobian. And we, we could kind of analyze it graphically and you could rotate it around and see this three-dimensional state space and project it down onto X and Y and Y and Z. And, uh, y, uh, and um, X and Z, but it's easier often if you can if you can reason about the lower dimensional system. It's easier to reason about. Okay, um, uh, so we linearize this and into these two equations. We said we don't need to analyze recovered. We just need to analyze two of them and it's susceptible infected and recovered is fixed. So. So if we locate the system at a certain point in state space with, let's say, 800 susceptibles and 600 infectives. That totally determines the number of recoveries. So we haven't lost any information. There's been no information lost by this, right? Okay. Um, so we analyze this then in terms of a two-dimensional Jacobian, right? We, we are focusing on S and I and their dynamics. We 
linearize, uh, excuse me, we take the derivative for the Jacobian in the normal way, take the derivative of these and we get this as the Jacobian. And the important thing here to, to recognize, you know that this is not a linear system, that it's a nonlinear system, because you look at the Jacobian and you see immediately what? What do you see in there that wouldn't be there for a linear system? Yeah, state variables. The, the value of the Jacobian depends on the state, depends on where you are in state space, what Jacobian applies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the fact that this Jacobian depends on the state means, you know, how the system changes, say, for each, so if we think about this, the top row of the Jacobian is all related to which, which, to what? Like if I had to tell you again, remind you, where did this top row of the Jacobian come from? Where, where, where whence does it come? It came from taking the successive derivative or the partial derivatives of the what? Yeah, the evolution of x, okay? Um, because after all, this, this top row of the matrix relates to, you know, it's just, the, tells us how to change the first element of the state vector, which relates to f. So this is partial f sub x, partial x, and this is partial f sub x, partial y, okay? Those are how those two terms come about. Now, so this is telling us basically that how the system responds with respect to a susceptible, like whether There'll be lots of, a high rate of infection of susceptibles. Um, how the system responds depends on the number of infectives, right? So whether, if, if, if we have no infectives, increasing the number of susceptibles, increasing the, the X component of the state factor, it's not gonna lead to a faster rate of change of of, uh, of, of the number of susceptibles. If we have zero infectives, it's not gonna lead to that. On the other hand, if we have tons of infectives, then increasing the number of susceptibles is going to lead to a very material change in the rate of change of susceptibles. We'll have people getting infected a lot more if there's a billion, a billion infectives around rather than if there's zero. If there's zero, nobody's gonna be infected, right? this term in the Jacobian will be zero. And the effects of adding more susceptibles on the rate of change of susceptibles, since the rate of change is already there, zero, um, then um, assuming recovered is also zero, then, we, then we're going to, um, then we're gonna have, have no effect. That, that first term um, will not be affected by susceptibles, okay? Um, by, by change in susceptibles. And so it is with each of these other terms. Um, excuse me, so that was for a system without loss of immunity. Um, okay, and then we sort of graduated, well, okay, so where are the fixed points here? Uh, where are the fixed points for this one? Can anyone remind me? They're actually written here just for the more general case. So where are these fixed points? Well, turns out there's, a lot of them, right? Any point where infectives is zero is a fixed point, right? Why, why is that? Can you, can, you, can you tell me? I mean, um, looking at this here, that, that seems like a very strong statement that any point where susceptibles are, or excuse me, infectives are zero is a fixed point, but it's right there, laid before us, uh, laid out by Maple. Why is this that if we have no infectives, we're at a fixed point? So yeah, no susceptibles can get infected. Moreover, can anyone recover? No, there's no one to recover. QED, right? It's, it's, there, there's no, gonna be no change in the system as long as we have zero infectives. Um, 
By contrast, is it the case if we have zero susceptibles that there's no change in the system? No one's going to get infected, but people might still what? They might still recover. So it's not a given. So there's a whole, a whole swack of of um, of uh, different uh, fixed points here. It's an un depending whether you count people as continuous or discrete. There's an uncountable number or a countable number, but of course it's uh, within the bounds of the population. Um, Okay, so if we go to a more interesting case where a lot of the same principles apply, it's this one. And here, the total population, is it fixed or not? An SIRS system, fixed or not? Fixed. We still have conservation of, of people. People are either, these stocks are collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. People are either in susceptible in fact to recover but wherever they are, um, uh, you know, they, they can't leave the system. It's a closed system, as we say. They just circulate. So the total population is constant. This is, it looks like nominally a 3D system, but it's actually a 2D system, okay? Conservation properties are one of these things that reduce dimensionality. Another thing that reduces dimensionality, as we'll see, is extreme coupling and nonlinear models between state elements of state space. Okay? That, like if two things are really tangled, the number of hairs and the number of, of links, that will reduce the dimensionality of the state space. Information, well, if you, if you tell me one or about its rate of recent change, its recent rate of change, I can tell you a lot about the other. They're not, they're not two totally independent things that are, it has, it has lower degrees of freedom because they're so coupled. A third thing that will reduce dimensionality is symmetries. We won't get into that much in this class, but if you're dealing with like a pipe, you know, you, you, you think about a really long pipe. Um, there may be symmetries by which basically, if you know what's going on you know, in one direction from the middle, you know what's going on in the other, um, uh, and and you know what's going on a little bit further down the pipe. And so symmetries are, are another thing that can reduce uh, dimensionality. It reduces the number of degrees of freedom of the system. Okay, so let's take a look at this, and let's treat it, if we can, without loss of generality here, as a 2D system. So we take advantage of this and we turn it into 2D, right? Okay, so here we go. And now here, do we have infinitely many, any, many fixed points? Well, let's reason. I mean, before we had, if anything, if anyone here was, if no one here was infective, this system was at a fixed point, right? Right? There were no new infectives and no new recoveries. Is that true for this new system? If we have no infectives, could there still be change somehow, somewhere? People could recover, right? Okay, we, it's true that we don't have any, sorry, excuse me, I have to be careful, not recover, they could lose their immunity, right? With no infectives, there'd be no one going down here. There's no one to get recovered. No infectives, there'd be no one getting infected because there's no transmission of infection. But what could there still be? they could lose their immunity, much as they do, I might know, from pertussis, okay? So they could still go down this way. So it's not the case that we have, you know, any number of fixed points when infectives are zero. That's far from the case here, okay? Sorry, if they lose their immunity, mm -hmm. wouldn't they go directly to infective? No, if they lose... They become too susceptible. But you don't have any infected persons. So that means you don't have to go from susceptible to infected. Correct. Correct. So they would, if, if you were to suddenly have a mass eradication of, of this virus from the, the system or, 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 you know, if you were to eliminate pertussis, no infectives, so you'd stop recoveries immediately. Um, but... What would happen 
would be th there'd be continued uh, people losing their immunity, so it would build up the number of susceptibles. Now, if you somehow stopped new infections from taking place, you know, you put everyone, you know, everyone in quarantine separately, like isolated everyone, right? Sequestered everyone. For a while, there'd still be people who had immunity from an earlier outbreak and they lose their immunity and they go back to susceptible and they become susceptible. None of them will get infected because they're all sequestered, but they'll be susceptible. So the system won't be in a fixed point there. There's in fact only two fixed points here. And what are these fixed points? At an intuitive level, what are these fixed points? Okay, they're either all susceptible, x equals 1,000, y equals zero. There's no infectives. Everyone's susceptible. And how many people recovered? Zero. That's one fixed point. It's, the system's in total balance. No one is getting infected, no one's recovered, no one's losing immunity. The other fixed point is what? What is this guy? 10 and, and, and 90 for Y. So it, balances the flows between them. it balances completely the flows. And I would note, if you have those two, what is, if the total population is 1,000, what's the value of the number of recovered that's implied? 900. 1,000 minus 90 minus 10, right? Okay. So there it's in total balance. So when we say ba total balance, what I mean is, okay, look, each of these stocks is unchanging, right? There's no rate of change of any of these stocks. So what does that imply? Like if, if we consider infectives, what does that imply? Does that mean no one's getting infected? No, it just means the number of new, of new infections per unit time is equal to what? Well, no, it doesn't mean zero necessarily equal to the number of people recovering per unit time. So then the number of effectives will have equal inflow and outflow. And so it won't be going up. The value of it at this balance, the number of infectives is 90, but it won't rise from that because people are recovering at the same, the same rate, the same number of people per unit time is, are getting infected, right? What else is true? Well, for recoveds, what must be the case? If that isn't changing, what must be the case? The, the rate at which people are recovering is the same at which, the same num number of people per, say per week, recover as lose immunity. And the same number of people lose immunity as get infected. So it's in total balance, all of those flows are, are in this sort of mutually consistent state where the system's in this equilibrium. Okay, so, so those are the two equilibria. One is very different than the other. Now, one of the most important things about how they differ though, is not just that they occur at different points. Can we locate each in state space? Where's, where's this first one? Uh, sorry, the second one where we have a thousand and, and zero. Where is this in this diagram? Yeah, it's this guy here. I actually start, well, truth is I, I didn't start it there. Truth is I started it one off from there. And we'll come to that in just a second. But it's basically down here. And if you were to go look at this really closely, um, you, would, you would see you know, some features of it there. But essentially it's, um, uh, it's there. And where's the other one? It's the other end of the rainbow, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's right here. So it's basically, we've got 10 people, 10 measly people. Um, they don't have to be measly. They could be kids, but they don't have to be. Um, 10 people here who are susceptible and 90 who are infective, right? That's, that's what that is. There's a, there's a fixed point there. And you can kind of see these, these arrows angling in here, okay? Um, but a key differentiator between these is whether they're stable or not, right? 
The first, well, the second of them, this one way over here, is it stable? No, it's, 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 it's unstable. And in fact, um, uh, if you look at it, it's the one on the left here for the so-called disease-free equilibrium. That's what DFE means here. Um, that's, that's unstable. Um, and it's unstable, we recognize it's unstable because what? What about these? We determine the eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix at that point. Remember, the Jacobian matrix here depends on state. So we have to consider the Jacobian at that point. Otherwise, that fixed term will be, will be dominating things, right? It's at the, the fixed point where the Jacobian tells us everything around that fixed point. Otherwise, we're, you know, we're dealing with that, we're dealing with this term in addition to this term. It's at, the, it's at a fixed point where this first term disappears. That's what's dictating things around that point, is, is this one here. At, at a fixed point, this one is zero, so we can focus on the Jacobian to understand the behavior. So around this point, a thousand with, with x equal, number, a thousand susceptibles, z, um, zero infectives and zero recoveds, uh, the Jacobian is shaping things, right? Um, and what is the Jacobian there? Well, the Jacobian there, it's going to involve zero y's, and, and x is going to be a thousand, and you can, you can compute it, right? Um, and from that Jacobian, you, will, you would see that fundamentally that Jacobian will, will send displacements for it off in a certain direction. So if we consider this, um, let's, let's actually plug this in, right? Let's, let's take this general Jacobian. Um, here we go. So it's the general Jacobian here is minus 0.01y, right, um, minus 0.01. Maybe I won't write it all because after all it's on the screen in a big way. Um, but what is it at, so at x equal 1,000, at the, DF, the DFE, the disease-free equilibrium, at x equal 1,000, y equals 0, z by implication is 0. What does this Jacobian become? What does this Jacobian become? So at that point, what do we have? Yeah, so, so y is going to be 0. So the upper left entry here is minus 0 0.01, right? We OK with that? Hearing no objections. Um, how about the, the upper right of it? OK, here we're asking, how does x, the rate of change of x change based on, on changes in y? So, um, so how does this, uh, how does, what, what's the value of that? I'll tell you, the rate of change of x, how many people get it? You know, or, or, or how, how quickly x has changed is going to depend a lot on y. So we did kind of expect this to be big at this disease-free equilibrium, but if one effect we're on, it's gonna to lead to a lot of change in X. So what's the value at that point? Well, X is a thousand, right? Mm hmm? Right? So this is gonna be, anyone? Yeah, so this is gonna be a thousand times 0.01, right? It's gonna be 10, right? As a minus sign up front. And then it's gonna be, uh, Minus 0.01 here, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's 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 going to be negative. It's minus if I'm if I'm not mistaken here, it's minus 10.01. Am I screwing up the minus signs? I, th I think that's correct. Um, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me if I'm screwing up because I'm operating in sleepwalking mode at this point. Um, um, you must think I have good dreams. Um, Okay, so uh, how about the lower right? Lower left, excuse me. Yeah, so it's zero, because y is zero. 
And what's uh, lower right? Nine point nine. Nine point nine. Okay. Do we see that? Right? Where did that come from? Well, it's 0 0.01 times a thousand, so it's one hundredth of a thousand or ten minus point point one. So it's nine point nine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out, so so let's let's think what this is doing geometrically, right? Let's think what this is doing. Remember, we have this, this thing gets multiplied by the state vector s, right? Mm -hmm. I need to put it in. I'll, I'll say this is by the state vector, right? x and y, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, it's susceptible to more than factors, right? So what is, it, what is it doing? Well, around this point, if we displace, this is actually change in x and change in y, right? From the fixed point, key point. This is not x and y. It's change in x from this fixed point and change in y from the fixed point, right? Remember, remember here we're dealing with this guy here, s minus s question mark. Because we're at a fixed point, f of s question mark is 0, right? And we're dealing with the Jacobian times the displacement from this fixed point, right? So let's go back to that. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with things that are going from this fixed point in the x direction, let's say. How would it transform it? Well, we, we've used this trick before when understanding the effects of matrices. If we go only in the x direction and no in the y direction, all it does is do what? From this matrix, you can just, all you have to look at is what? Well, if, it, if the first entry is 1 and the second entry is 0, for example, all it does is pick out the what? First column, right? Mm -hmm. um, all, it, all it's going to do is it's going to, when you multiply it, right, we're going to have minus 0.01 times delta x plus, plus minus 10.01 times delta y. And on the bottom, it's 0 times delta x plus 9.9 uh, .9 delta y. Delta y is 0. All you're going to get is the first first thing, right? So when you are considering going only in an x direction away from this, right? All you're going to get out is something which is going to lower the rate of change associated with with uh, x. Okay, so. So it's going to be going sort of negatively and x by a small amount and zero. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go to this next uh, this next slide, but I don't know if you can you can see that, but that's exactly what happens around here. If you go in this x direction, it kind of points a vector back towards the fixed point because it's negative in x, so it's pointing in the negative x direction and zero and y, it's just pointing a vector back. But if we go in the y direction from around this fixed point, this fixed point is just, just there. You know, there's, there's a mouse. OK. Um, the mouse is called different things in different cultures. Um, uh, and some cultures refer to it as the needle. Um, so. So zero. Um, so so if we're at that x equal a thousand, y equals zero, right? Um, then then what's going to happen if if we're if we're at that point, we go in the y direction only. So delta x is zero, y. All it picks out is the y. Second column. All right. It's going to pick out the second column. If we go. We go upwards from this fixed point just a little bit, right? We go upwards. What this is telling us is that the rate of change of the system is going to point in the minus x direction and the minus y direction. And it's going to point 
equally. That's why it almost equally, right? It's going to point minus x just about at the same magnitude, just same magnitude, just different sign as the as the change in the y direction. So y is going to increase or decrease? Yeah, increase. Or the we should say the rate of change associated with, well, no, it's 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 y, right? Because these dictate the rate of change of the appropriate thing. Y is going to, if that's positive, 9.9, .9, um, as we go in the y direction, it's going to tend to it's going to tend to, to uh, go in this uh, positive uh, direction. So we're going to be seeing a positive change in y. And we're going to be seeing a negative change in x. And that's why it points up in this upper left. It's almost 45 degrees. Do you see that? Because these two entries are almost equal. right? So it's, it's telling us that as we go out in a certain direction, the Jacobian is going to be telling us as we go in that direction, how does it shape the rate of change of the system, S dot, right? As we, as we change state, as we consider going in a, in a certain direction around this fixed point, that displacement induces a change in the rate of, the rate of change of the system. Um, and uh, this is what we see within these, uh, these components here. So, Basically, as we go upwards from this point, the system wants to change. It, it heads off in a direction which is decreasing y, to decreasing x, and increasing y by roughly similar amounts, right? So it's like minus 45 degrees. Do you see that? Do you see that here? It's, it's a question. Yeah. Oh, disease-free equilibrium. Okay. Meaning there's, there's, at the equilibrium itself, there's no one infected. Yep. Right? It's disease-free. Others is susceptible. Do, do we appreciate that? Okay, now let's focus on this other fixed point. What's going on with this other fixed point? So this is DFB. Let's talk about the endemic equilibrium, EE. Okay, um... So this is at x equals 10, y equals 90, and z equals what? 900. Oh, sorry. This shouldn't say 900. It should say 90. And z equals 900, right? Most people are actually recovered. Are they not? Or not? Okay, so at that point, what's going to be happening um, with respect to this Jacobian? Can anyone fill in the entries for me? Yeah, so this one requires a little bit more thinking. Okay, so let's, let's, let's write out it as an intermediate product. Um, we, we can write out the various terms just so we're clear about where they're coming from. So x equals 10, y equals uh, 90, right? So the general Jacobian has minus 0.01 times y, which is 90, right? Times 90, right? Yeah, so it's, if you, if you but, it's, but it's minus 0.01 too, right? Minus 0.01, yeah? So it's minus 0.01 times 90, which is minus 0.9 minus 0.01, which is 0.91, right? Or, excuse me, minus 0.91, right? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay. Okay, there we go. Um, um, okay, so how about on the upper right? So that's how the rate of change of x is is dictated for uh, for a change in y. What is it? It's minus 0.01 times x. 
x is 10, right? Right? Yeah. Minus 0 0.01, right? Is that right? Yeah? So, so what does that give us? Well, minus 0 0.01 times 10 gives us minus 0 0.1, and we subtract further this guy here, right? So it's going to give us minus, zero, it's minus 0 0.11. Oh, I'm glad I'm not taking an exam right now. Um, uh, uh, no calculators allowed. Um, okay, 0 .0, 0 0.01 times y. Okay, so minus, so 0 0.01 times 90 is just 0 0.9, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the last term, 0 0.0. 0 0.01 times x is 10, so that's going to give us 0.1, right? Minus 0.1, it's going to give us what? Zero. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay. So, um, uh, is, double check that. Is that right? Yeah? Okay, that is true. Yeah. Okay, um, so at this endemic point, we're going to get uh, that as the Jacobian. So as we go around this endemic point here, so the endemic point is, I think, right at this 10 and 90, right? This is the, the, the forks. Um, it's kind of the, the confluence of all these things, okay? So, so here at this point, as we go in the x direction, what happens? The system wants to point us in what direction? Well, if we go purely in the x direction, yeah, we're increasing in y uh, and decreasing in x, but roughly similar magnitudes, right? Um, and you can kind of see it again. Sometimes I, I like to, to switch switch back. That's why these, so if we go only in the x direction, you see these arrows that are sort of pointed up and to the left? They want to decrease x, so that's why they're going left, and they want to increase y, that's where they're going up, right? And then if we go in the y direction, what do we get? Well, if, if we go in the y direction alone, we just pick out that second column, right? And basically, it's going to de want to decrease in x and no change in y. And this is maybe a little bit harder to see here. But um, basically, there's, th there's going to be arrows coming down from the upper left and going up here. And it turns out that it's, it's going to be a slight sort of dis uh, displacement um, that's going to be there. You can't see that that well in that area. Okay? But... We can, use the, we can use these Jacobians to kind of understand the geometry of why it's pushing things in different directions around the fixed point. But even more significantly, I think, um, you can take the eigenvalues of these Jacobians and eigenvectors. Now, the eigenvalues of this first one can be read out directly from the diagonal because it's got the zero here. So it turns out, in that case, you can just read out these. And so the eigenvalues for the disease-free equilibrium are minus 0 0.01 and 0.9, okay? Um, and so what that's telling us is that one of the eigenvalues is getting scrunched over time. It's getting sort of progressively pulled in. It, it, one of the eigenvalues is getting decrease, the magnitude of it is getting decreased over time, like per, you know, e to the minus 0.01t. It's getting, there was maybe some component that I can value um, in the displacement, but it's going to be getting smaller and smaller. But the other one, sort of in that vicinity, as you're in that vicinity, um, and the other one is, and by the way, that one's associated with an eigenvalue of what? Of one, so basically, um, it, that's in the the x directions, and then the other one is going to have a magnitude of 0.99 in the 
in this direction. So this is this eigenvalue wants to go in the direction of lessening x and increasing y in roughly similar proportion. So basically what's going to happen around this point is it's sucking in kind of slowly this way and this way. That's hence you see it pointing this way, pointing this way. It's kind of sucking these in according to to minus 0.01, you know, any displacement there is pulled into the fixed point. It's, it's pulled into it, um, according to this. Any displacement gets decreased over time at this rate of, of minus 0.01. Any displacement purely in the x direction. So it's, it's sucking it in like the vacuum sound south of the border. Um, um, you folks are too young to remember that. Um, Wade might, might know what I'm talking about, but uh, um, in the other direction, um, the other uh, the, the other direction by contrast, the other eigenvalue, which is sort of in this diagonal line, um, it is is it decreasing it over time? No, it's spitting it out. It's increasing it in, in a faster and faster rate. That's e to the 9.9. Um, so the other eigenvalue is getting magnified. As you go in that direction away from this fixed point, <coughs> in this natural direction of it, minus 0.71. Yeah, so, so that's decreasing x, increasing y by roughly a similar magnitude. So you go in this, this line here. It's going to shoot it faster and faster, like e to the 9.9, well, it's not meant to be a Greek letter, 9.9t, okay? Um, there we go. Um, so it's going to be shooting it faster and faster in that direction. That's its kind of characteristic, two characteristic directions in the area of the fixed point. That's its natural coordinate system. This one is sucked in this way. This one is shot out this way to the upper left. And those two are independent. They evolve independently. One sucks in these sort of displacements, and one pushes out those displacements. And you know, you, you, you have it essentially um, amplifying one, and the other is just getting damped out. It, it's it kind of a, a deviation purely in the x direction. Um, it's going to pull back. It's going to be resilient to that. It's going to, it's going to be able to stably handle that. But it, if you get it out in this direction here, um, if you have some component of this vector and the, that, that is in the 45 degree line roughly, if, if, if your displacement has some component of that vector, you're going to be sucked out here. You're going to be thrown out here, ejected here in a faster and faster way. Okay, um, so I guess that's the blowing side north of the border. Um, so it's going to shoot out uh, faster and faster. It's like a, you know, a feedback on a microphone. And it's shoot out there. Yeah. So, so what, where does that e come from? Sorry. The e? Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember here? Um, last time. I had a big derivation oh, here, yeah, so and the derivation basically said if you have s dot, and this could be a vector, equals some j s. And we could be yeah. this, doing this just around a fixed point, right? Mm -hmm. Then this can be solved, mm -hmm. just, like, just like if you have dx dt here, equals lambda x gives the solution, um, you know, e to the alpha t in some constant. This gives a solution e to the, and, and what you have to do is decompose this, and, and basically it's going to be s, s inverse, and this is going to be a diagonal matrix times s here. Okay, oh sorry, times t. Um, but 
this diagonal matrix consists of what? Of the, remember, S and S, S and S and inverts are converting into the eigenspace, so according to the, the eigenvectors. And this is a matrix of, this matrix consists of eigenvectors, okay? And what I argued is that this matrix, ultimately, it's varying. It turns out it's varying according to, we could write it this way, a matrix where each of these is e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda 2t, e to the lambda 3t, and the rest are zero. So again, eigen, eigen um, space basically decouples those components. It allows you to analyze this in terms of the modes right around there. There's this kind of this X mode, which will suck itself back. That's eigenvector one, zero. And the other is this mode where it's shooting out to the upper left, right? And this e to the 9.9t, therefore, came just from this eigenvalue, this, this component here. This other one, this e to the minus 0 0.01, that came from this eigenvalue. Okay. So in this area, that is kind of the dominant behavior of the system. Right around that fixed point, you have this it accelerating things in the upper left, which is basically an outbreak. Right? We have a big increase in the number of, of infectives. That's the second component of this eigenvector. And, a, and a, almost exactly the same decrease in the number of susceptibles, basically people are getting infected. Lots of people are getting infected. It's going in that direction. It's being amplified over time, according to this e to the 9.9. .9. Does that make sense? OK. OK, so that's, that's for that one. Now, this other one, where we have this, this other vector, um, we have different, different eigenvalues. These eigenvalues. Is this stable or not stable? Stable. It's stable. But it has two eigenvalues, um, two, two eigenvectors associated with it in different directions. Okay, so um, one of these eigenvectors is involves a component where it's going in a whoa, negative x direction and an almost comparable increase in y. And that's that that's these ones here, these upper left arrows in its vicinity. That's one of its kind of natural directions. Or if we switch over to this around this, that's that's this natural direction. Remember the eigenvectors are not necessarily in one direction because if you have an eigenvector um, by definition um, the eigenvector is defined as something where you multiply it by the Jacobian matrix here and you get out of something proportional to that eigenvector. So if you take the minus of an eigenvector, it's also an eigenvector. This is just, this is the axis, right? It's this 45 degree axis that's one of the eigenvectors, this guy here, right? It's, it's this one sort of associated with it. That's that eigenvector. This is a different eigenvector. What does this one involve? Well, it's like a, we're, 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 we're increasing x. Um, this is, you know, for an increase in x, we go down in y by a much larger amount, right? Um, so we go down in y um, for a small increase in x. So an increase in x of like 0.139, we get a decrease in y of almost one, right? So that's gonna be, that's gonna be something where we're going to have a small, de uh, excuse me, a, a big decrease in, okay, so let me see if I can find this. So a small increase in x, right, um, is going to lead to a, big decrease in y. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if 
Okay, so the, the problem is that this is on different scales, so it, it sort of distorts the, the um, relative size of these changes relative to each other. One of these axes is going to be this way, left, almost left and right. You can see it slightly, and the other is going to be this way. And if, we, if, we, if I were careful and I plotted it out so that both the x and the y have a span of 20, we would see the, the, the sort of the angles correctly. And we'd see that basically one of them is, is almost a one-to-one trade-off, and the other, or not quite one-to-one, -one, but the other has, has a disproportionate trade-off. Those are its two natural axes around this fixed point. And in both cases, what is it doing? Is it spitting out? No, it is sucking it in. It's sucking it in this way, sucking it in. And that's why you see these arrows opposing each other. You can't really see it underneath here, but you sort of follow them down. They, they, they suck in, they suck in. Notice that this is no longer linear. I mean, it's, it's this kind of curvilinear line here that there's kind of a curve, and you see it twists around here. This is a nonlinear system, but around this fixed point, you can describe it somewhat linearly. You can describe it linearly, and here, any displacement along either of these natural axes, these eigenvectors, will lead to a sort of sucking in according to the respective eigenvalues, these guys here. Right? E to the minus 0.78 and E to the minus 0.12. And it, and it handles both equally. Does that make sense? So that's what's going on around these fixed points, is you have basically dynamics along these natural axes that evolve independently of one another because of this diagonalization property we talked about last time. You diagonalize according to the, to the uh, Jacobian. And it, in this case, it's stable. Any deviation um, uh, it will be sucked in. And any of those two directions will be sucked in. So any deviation around this point. By contrast, in this one here, a deviation purely along one of the eigenmodes um, uh, will be sucked in, but the other one will be amplified and spat out. Does that make sense? That is, is the sort of linearized analysis of this. Now, um, let us go to the system that I asked you to analyze, okay? Um, which we'll be concentrating on more next time because it illustrates, um, okay, um, yeah. Um, it illustrates some additional features of the system. So this is, the, the system on which it's classically based is the same one we've just been looking at, okay? S, I, R, um, we have some loss of immunity and some recoveries, but we elaborated it. So this is the behavior of that system over time. But here, whoa, uh, we elaborated it to allow for a recovery delay. And where the recovery delay is based on some number of healthcare workers, um, a constant for, for the given model, and then the number of people waiting. The idea is, look, if I go present for care, if there's a lot of infectives ahead of me who need to be treated, I wait longer. But if I'm the first infective who's presented, I don't have to wait long. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so that's this term here. That's why we have a, a recovery time that earlier we, our recovery time was fixed. It was some fixed recovery time, mu. This is the recovery delay. Here, the recovery time is going to be a function of state. Because if there's lots of infectives in front of me, it's going to, it's going to be, take me longer to recover. So it's, it's some minimum time like for me to go present for care, plus some, some linear function of the number of infectives, other infectives. Hmm? I'm waiting for my turn in line. Um, and so if there's a lot of infectives ahead of me, I wait longer. And per healthcare worker, I wait time. Um, uh, so I'm going to wait. Each healthcare worker requires time to tout and treat a patient and 
This is how many people can be processed in, in, in parallel. So this turns the system into a different state. And what, what happens is um, that you get a system which is, has some very interesting properties, extremely interesting properties. Number one, if there's too few people initially infected, what do you think happens? Well, are they going to wait long or wait little? A very small amount of time. The recovery time may be very small. Mu plus tau times I over H will be very small because I over H is, is small enough. And so actually, if people get treated fast enough, the infection could, for certain parameter settings, die off. Hmm? Just dies out. By contrast, if you have enough people waiting ahead of you in line, I go and I wait, and while I'm waiting, I might infect other people. <laughs> right? Anyone waiting could infect other people is the idea. And so then the infection can take off. And of course, as it starts taking off, what's going to happen for subsequent people who have to seek care? They're going to wait even longer. They're going to wait longer. So it's going to go into this mode. It's going to be locked into the system where, to the state where you have very, very high number of people infected. Because each such infective maybe waiting in line, but there's tons of other people infected. So it's going to take forever for them to recover, so to speak, so to speak. And, and that's going to lead to lots of people getting infected because people can't get treated in time, right? They're waiting for their appointment 20 days from now or 100 days from now, and they're spreading the infection meanwhile, okay? Um, and this is the recovery delay. It goes up to like thousands of hours or what have you. Okay, um, now, if you go look at these equations, the number of healthcare workers has a very large bearing on the, the ultimate locked in level of prevalence. So, well, you tell me, if you have more healthcare workers, do you think it will lead to a higher number of people in this endemic equilibrium that are infected or a lower number? H. Yeah. So if we have, if H is greater, will the number of people infected at this sort of locked in equilibrium where people are just tons of people are sick and they're waiting, will that be higher or lower? If more healthcare workers will be lower and fewer healthcare workers, it will be, be larger. So if you actually look, if I have 30 healthcare workers, for example, that's blue here. If I have 40, that's red. If I have 50, that's green. If I have 60, that's gray. Where's 70? 70 never takes off. Completely goes away. It, it never takes off, or if I introduce them later, it can make some difference. So watch this. Okay, so, so if I have 70 healthcare workers from the start, the infection never takes off, given the certain number of people starting, okay? It's that ratio of healthcare workers to initial people that's one of the key, key factors here. Um, and uh, this is, excuse me, this is for recovery delay. This is recovery delay. This is the core, oh, yeah, this is interesting. That's recovery delay. How much time it takes them to recover. This is for prevalence. So notice, this is baseline 30. I got a 40, I got a 50, I got a 60. Look at this, between blue and gray, I'm doubling the number of healthcare workers, right? Is it having the prevalence? No, it's a nonlinear, folks, it's nonlinear. It, it, it only responds a little bit. But if I got a 70, where is it? It's gone, in fact, you see it decreasing here. Basically, it goes to zero from the start. Yes, the levy. <coughs> the, uh, sorry, the prevalent, this is the fraction of people that are infected here. The fraction that are infected. Um, so this is if we have people early. Let's check out, yes, Alex. This, this doesn't take, in, this particular model doesn't take into account natural recovery. 
Correct. Know? Correct. This is this is like if you if it's treatment, it's called treatment mediated recovery. Like you 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 have to to recover, you need to be treated. Um, this is this is um, uh, a description of that. Um, and there are certain conditions where natural recovery is very difficult. Um, now, the interesting thing is, what we've just seen is early availability of healthcare workers. What I'm considering here is the prevalence and the waiting time, the recovery delay. If you are, I should say, recovery delay, if you have those healthcare workers from the start, and we see it's very nonlinear. Doubling the number of healthcare workers doesn't lead to half the prevalence. It, it actually is it's very stiff until you reach a certain point, and then it's a game changer. And it's a tipping point. Let's take a look at this, though. What if you introduce those healthcare workers later? Suppose they're not there from the start. Suppose they're not there from the start. You see, if, if they're there from the start, 70 healthcare workers does the trick, right? See this? It, it, it causes the infection to never take off. What do you think? If I introduce 70 after the infection is already established, what do you think is going to happen? Sorry? Okay, so let's, let's take a look. So here, this is late. So 30 is the blue. 50 is the, is, so if, if I enter, sorry. I have, I have a, sorry, I should be careful. Uh, the infection starts with only 30 healthcare workers. And then imagine we bring them in. You know, maybe this is in swift current. And we bring in another 50. Um, starting at time 250. So we've gone up from 30 to 80. Mm -hmm. What happens? Well, this is the prevalence to this point is extremely high. Swift current is in bad shape. Right? Um, okay. Um, starting at time 250, we have 80 instead of 30. Almost three times as many. Excuse me, almost two times. Three times as many. Yeah, almost three. Between two and three. And, and, and at that point, it'll bring down the infection. But it won't bring it down to zero. Prevalence is not going to zero. Far from it. it it, it shows some gain, but it's, it's not a huge, going up from 30 to 80. Let's suppose, no, by the way, 30 to 80, ladies and gentlemen, where was 80 here? 80 would be gone. It would never take off with 80. Do you see that? It never takes off with 70 here. If you have them from the start with early availability, it never takes off. Do you see that? Okay. So with 80, though, here it, it barely makes a dent, so to speak, or 70 barely makes a dent. You know, uh, 80 would be, brings it down, but it, it's still really high. I mean, it's still like, you know, over 75% of the population is infected. Okay, now let's bring in, let's bring in the heavy artillery. Let's bring in 100 new healthcare workers. Bring it up from 30 to 130, okay? That's the blue, that's the green rather. 130, almost twice the number we needed to eradicate it before, if we had them from the start. 130, that's the, this, this uh, green line. Does it eliminate it? No. Why isn't it eliminating? Well, well look at, look at, Okay, then we, we like pull out all the stops. 200 more brought in. We had 30 originally, now we have 230. Does it eliminate it? No. We bring in 250 additional ones beyond the 30 that were there originally. Does it eliminate it? No. It's only if we bring in 300 that we can eliminate. What's going on? I mean, here we need 330 to eliminate it, it's like, or, you know, that's, that's when it makes the transition. Even 280, 30 original, plus 250 more, 280 
does not eliminate it, whereas over here, 70 eliminated it. What's going on? What's going on? Why is this? Well, there's this phenomenon of lock-in, okay? Lock-in, the system gets trapped in a mode and it would have required a lot less work to prevent that mode from happening, like 70 healthcare workers, than once it's established to get it out of that mode. And ladies and gentlemen, there are countless things in life involving health as well as other things where this is the case. Addictions is one of them, right? If you could head it off early on, it doesn't require perhaps that much effort. But if you have to deal with it after the fact, you're dealing with someone who's addicted, it could take a huge amount of effort to get them to break out of their addiction. Cycle of poverty is another one. There's lots of circumstances where, where um, you get lock-in effects. And as we say in English, uh, a stitch in time saves nine. Uh, later, right? Um, it, it prevents a much bigger amount of work later if you can head it off earlier. Prevention can make, can really decrease the amount of effort required compared to remediating the situation, trying to pick up the pieces after the fact. Yes, the levy. Okay, so we're we're gonna we're uh, we'll jump forward to this, and then we will. Um, uh, I'll I'll give you a sneak preview here, recognizing that we have to break here in just a second. Okay, so so the basic deal is that we have a system here with multiple equilibria, like those previous ones we saw, but the equilibria are of two sorts, okay? Sorry. So there's actually three equilibria for this, okay? Two basic sorts. One is a disease-free equilibrium, just like that one. If you have no disease, no one infected, and, you know, no one, it's, it's, it, there's, there's no one infected here at all, and, everyone is susceptible, no one infected. That's stable, oh, excuse me, it's not stable. That's, that's an equilibrium, it's in balance. Is it stable? No, it's definitely not stable. Okay, um, for, with, with, with the parameters I gave you, it's not stable, it's unstable. There's two endemic equilibria associated with this, okay? Um, and um, here, there's a, um, there's uh, an equilibria uh, in two different planes here, okay? And the basic deal is, um, if you start with a different number, okay, I'm gonna have to come back to this next time to explain this well. But the basic deal is if you start with the right ratio, if you start with enough healthcare workers given the number of people initially infected, it will go from a situation of the infection dying out to a situation where, uh, or, or staying to a situation where it dies out, okay? And as we say, there are these different basins of attraction. So this bottom one, um, will tend to be to gravitate towards a certain equilibrium. This upper one will tend to gravitate towards another equilibrium. And there's this boundary here. It's kind of like you, you have different watersheds. You know, so we'll have maybe, maybe there's a, a mountain range, right? They, they say that in the, um, along the Icefield Parkway, so you can go up to the Columbia Icefields, and they say there's a place there, I think it's on the Athabasca glass, uh, Glacier, where if, you know, if a drop of water rolls down from this place one meter away, it will end up eventually, assuming no, it won't evaporate, it will end up you know, in the Pacific Ocean. 
and there's another one where it'll end up, you know, one meter away, it'll end up in the Arctic Ocean. And one of the interesting things is, like, within a half a kilometer there or something, there's one that will end up, I think, in the Hudson Bay, um, uh, essentially the Atlantic, um, the Atlantic uh, area, if I'm not mistaken. In any case, the point is that, you know, we, we talk about um, continental divide, for example, in North America, where, you know, you're, you're either on one side or the other of it, and, and going on one side will lead to you to stick on that side. The other side will lead to stick on that side. And in both, so in both cases, there's this attraction going on, okay? So if you start slightly off, you'll be attracted to a different point, okay? And this upper one will attract to very high levels of infectives. See that? It will suck upwards to high levels of infectives. Um, uh, whereas the bottom one will, will excuse me, tend, um, tend in, well, in this case, to lead to extinction with enough healthcare workers. That same number of healthcare workers will lead it to, to stay uh, very strong. Now, a very, to very high. Now, if you increase the number of healthcare workers enough, what it's going to be doing is bringing you to a certain point where suddenly you're able to get down to this lower basin of attraction. And here you, you can eliminate the infection with that number of healthcare workers. But it requires a lot more resources to make that the case if you're in this upper basin. So these are what we call basins of attraction, and they're basins around fixed points. The fixed points have, are stable and are sucking things in, and, and they, they each attract. It's kind of like the Arctic Ocean on the one hand, the Pacific Ocean on the other. Those are stable. They attract the water down to them, um, and you can get stuck in one instead of the other. You know, um, some might prefer the Pacific, um, others the Arctic, but, um, but the point is once you're in one, it can be, take a lot of work to get over to the other, but with enough effort you can get over, okay? And there's a lot of systems like this in life where once you're established in a certain mode, software projects are like this for where, where they get so tumultuous, they're always fighting fires, they can't settle down, it's low quality code, they lose people all the time who are demoralized um, with enough churn, you know, they're spending tons of time interviewing people or bringing people up to speed who leave quickly, they have to write all these things down because people are so transient and it's a lot of work and it demoralizes them further to spend their time, you know, writing voluminous documentation and they feel ashamed of their code quality, they feel the client's not happy, and they persist in that mode. Meanwhile, there's gelled teams where maybe it's the same people started off differently, they click and it keeps people's morale high and they can hire good people and they don't have to write down much because people want to stay and, and they're there for a long time so they're experts in the code base and few bugs get in. Or you take it for uh, wards for people with dementia. Um, it turns out with the right nurse, really savvy nurse, Jeff McDonald related this to me. He said, look, with a really, really good nurse in a dementia ward, they can sense problems coming. They can like read the situation very acutely and they know we have to handle Mr. So-and-so carefully this morning. They fly ahead of the plane, as we say, and they you know, they work with him, they spend time, they, they help, 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 help him de-escalate as he's getting worked up, and, and the situation stays stable. By contrast, same ward, um, an inexperienced nurse um, might not see it coming, that person blows up, and that, that freaks out other people in the ward who, who have dementia and are really scared and act up. And that leads to this ripple through effect where the whole ward's just a mess. And it's constantly going from fire, fighting fire to fighting fire, constantly just trying to, to play whack-a-mole to prevent the situation from getting even worse out of hand. And you're constantly dealing with just running to stay, to stay where you need to stay. It's, 
you're, you're constantly working against the nature of things. Um, two dimensional worlds. Heading off and preventing things can often be much more, much more cost effective than, than dealing with it after the fact and trying to pick up the pieces. And this recurs in many areas of life, including pers our personal lives, but also in, you know, in, in many organizational spheres and decision-making spheres. And um, you, know, you see it in the ARCH program, trying to piece things together for people with, with opioid dependence, or you see it in, um, in cases of, of people who don't see the doctor anymore, and, and therefore they're not getting the primary care, and they become high users of emergency care and end up only showing up when they have desperate conditions and eating tons of work done for them, whereas it could have been headed off by a, a primary care you know, nurse practitioner or, or, or physician. So a lot of situations like this, and we'll go into this more next time. Okay? Yes, Alex. Any example of that special, when I worked at IBM, every second Friday people did kind of funny parody presentations yeah. in the amphitheater, and one of them was uh, the difference between groups with high code quality and high happiness and low code quality and low happiness, uh -huh. with the, the difference being the frequency at which managers purchase lunches for their team. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, yeah, all the managers purchase lunch for their teams out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Managerial decision making can often make a big difference whether you head this way, head that way. Yeah. And often early life experiences for kids make a huge difference whether you head this way or that way. Um, um, and, and this is why they talk about critical phases of childhood and so on. Um, and you know, one of the defining features here is not just there's a tipping point, but that once you've crossed the tipping point, it's a lot, 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 lot harder to make a given improvement than it would have been if you had never crossed it in the first place. There's kind of, you're locked into a different mode of behavior, like homelessness or, you know, disorder uh, due to addictions or something, and it just, you know, trying to rescue things is just, um, is just incredibly more time consuming. So we'll analyze this more next time, okay? We'll see how it relates to those fixed points that you worked on and the stability and uh, how the equation of uh, it, the, the, you know, the number of healthcare workers or the number of initial infectives per healthcare worker, as it were, ends up affecting things. Small difference can make a big, uh, a big shift in behavior. Okay? Thank you very much. Uh, about the what? Good question. Um, you can reason about the relative change of X and Y, but you're not reasoning about the speed of that movement because it's not illustrating here. The, these arrows, the way they've drawn them here, it's not illustrating how quickly it's changing in a given direction. It's merely illustrating what direction it's going in, in terms of the rate of change of x and y. Yeah. I would like to find yeah. Um, what this is, I believe it is facilitating the treatment. It's not prevention. Sorry. It is treatment facilitation. It's it's, it's an intervention. Uh, that's counted as an intervention. Yeah, intervention, but that is prevention. This is not prevention. But there, it, it relates directly to prevention needs. Now you could say, there's actually a little bit of, uh, I disagree with you some, most directly, you're, you're absolutely right, it's treatment. But to say that it's not prevention is also oversimplifying it because if you can treat someone fast enough, it prevents other people from getting infected in the first place. And where this gets into prevention in a big time is this idea of early availability of healthcare workers. Here, you're preventing the infection from taking off at all. This, this completely eliminates the infection early on. Having enough healthcare workers early avoids it taking off. Whereas, if you only have them late, you are, you are dealing with an outbreak after the fact. So, you are preventing an outbreak here 
by treating people fast enough early. You're right that it's treatment-based, but this huge number of people are prevented from, from gathering infection if you have those healthcare workers early. If you have them only late, it requires a massive amount more and you, um, you, know, you, you haven't prevented the outbreak in the first place, but you can prevent it going forward if you have enough from, from taking place. Yeah, and this is a big actual issue you might be interested to know for HIV, because these days there's a lot of a lot of emphasis intervention-wise in HIV is actually about treatment of the people with HIV, and the the recognition being that that treatment for HIV these days lowers the viral load level in each person so much that they have very little chance of infecting someone else. So they're, it's helping their clinical condition, but it's also preventing them from transmitting it. So uh, the, the viral load is so low, they have almost no chance of transmitting yeah, it. Makes sense. Yeah, but yeah. Like, can, can Uh, no, it, it, it prevents later people from getting infected. If you view it as system science lens, the treatment and the prevention are intertwined. Yes. You know, but it's working. It's working through treatment yes. rather than working specifically through a prevention. It's not, for example, vaccination, where the person never gets uh you know, the, the, the intervention is through a mechanism that prevents um, uh, infection in the first place. But the, the, the knock-on effect, the natural result of it, is that tons of people are prevented from getting disease if you intervene early enough. But the actual intervention is via treatment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. There, there are there are ways to prove that for certain classes of models. In other words, for certain size and class of ordinary differential equations, you can you can prove it. Yeah. It means we don't expect any more fixed points. That's correct. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Good questions. <laughs>